Wow, look at you guys. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Matthew. I've been asked to give my testimony of who I used to be and who I am now. Um, I was raised in an Irish Catholic household. Went to uh, Catholic school until the fifth grade where the, uh, the nuns asked me to leave. I, was, I guess I was too much for grown women to handle. Um, uh, I went to public school from fifth grade to eighth grade and then my father told me you will go to Catholic high school and you will graduate or we will have a wake in your honor so and I believed him I have three older brothers a younger brother and a younger sister um, pretty much learned how to fight and to drink through that Irish background I know that's kind of a uh, what do you call it a scenario or a stereotype and, and yes, it, it is, but it, it doesn't come from, it's like legends. They don't come from nowhere. They come from something. And uh, in my house, it was called the quick and the hungry when it came to dinner time. And I had to fight three older brothers to get something to eat. And looks like I won, huh? Anyway, um, I graduated high school at 18 years old. Um, I had always been rebellious. Just, I don't know if it stemmed from when I first got smacked on the butt by the doctor when I was born and just kind of said, hey, that ain't right, and rebelled ever since, or, or how it worked, but I just had something in me that, that I didn't like authority, I didn't like being told what to do, and, and I thought, man, I'm just going to live free, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own thing. So when I was 18 years old, I moved out and bought myself a Harley, um, been riding two wheels since I was 11 years old, so... It was kind of a natural transgression. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Is that a Freudian slip or what? Um, anyway, uh, started hanging out guys with like-minded that uh, rode Harleys. And through some time passing, I ended up getting introduced to a motorcycle club that you probably heard of called the Hells Angels. I rode with those guys for three years. And uh, it was very interesting, um, to say the least. Uh, I liked... The brotherhood of it. I like the bondage, uh, I mean the bonding of it. Um, I liked uh, I liked it it was kind of the three musketeer type scenario. Um, all for one and one for all and and if I used to see if one guy start, got into a fight man every angel that was there was poof on it you know and I thought man I want that, that that's cool. And so um, got introduced to Wayne Puccinelli Wayne Puccinelli, who was the uh, president of the San Francisco chapter. I was a union carpenter back in those days, and I helped remodel his house and did work for motorcycle parts and that thing. And through some situations, I got asked to prospect, which means become a prospective member. And I thought that was the greatest thing ever. I said, man, I finally made it. I can, I can become an angel. And went home and told my girlfriend at the time, who was my beautiful wife, Gina, of 30 years and uh, we've been living together for about um, three and a half years at the time and I told her I said yeah I got asked to prospect this is great and she said oh good for you and she went in the bedroom and about 10 minutes later it came out with a suitcase and said, what are you doing where are you going them or me because I've seen them and you, you're gonna be one of them I don't want anything to do with you so it took me all of about five seconds to decide because the story with her is I when I first met her you know, they say there's no such thing as love at first sight. When I crossed eyes with her, I said, man, that's it. That's going to be my wife. That's, that's mine right there. That, ooh, ooh, yeah, that, ooh. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we were living together, and I was a union carpenter, like I said, in, in San Francisco, and, and the bottom just kind of dropped out of the housing industry, the construction industry, kind of like now. And um, there was no work. I, I couldn't find a job to save my life. And my truck broke down and my bike broke down and, and, and my, I was on unemployment and that ran out. And uh, my mom was bringing us groceries. I think she did that just so I wouldn't move back home, but um, <laughs> just to help us out. And so when I was walking around this little town that I lived in called Brisbane, it's just outside of San Francisco. And um, looking for work, you know, see somebody with a, a ratty fence or their house needed to be painted or their deck needed repair and knock on the door, hey, you know, I work cheap, 
nothing, 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 nothing. So one Sunday morning, I thought, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my luck. Maybe if I start going back to church, because when I was raised, you went to church every Sunday, unless you were dying, and even then, you you went, or my father would know why. But I hadn't darkened the doorway of a church in almost ten years, and uh, I said, all right. So I went to church. I couldn't tell you what they said. Couldn't tell you what they preached. Nothing. But I had a dollar thirty-two in my pocket and about a half pack of cigarettes and. Cigarettes back then were $1.30 a pack. I think they're like five bucks a pack or something now. It's crazy. Anyway, um, the plate came around and I, I thought, well, I pulled my money out of my pocket and looked at the cigarettes and went, put it in the pot and off it went. And I thought, the prayer I prayed was, okay, Lord, that's it. I got nothing left. It's up to you. God will honor a prayer like that. The next day, I ran into a guy coming out of the um, building department in the town I was living in with blueprints under his arm. And I had worked for him in the past. And I said, hey, Herman, you got any work? And he said, I got something coming up in a couple of weeks. I'll give you a call. Okay, great. That night he called me and said, hey, I do got a job in San Francisco. If you can get there tomorrow morning, it's yours. So, okay. So I had a friend of mine throw my tools in his truck and off we went to the city. He unloaded my tools with me. I met the foreman on the job. He was a guy I went to high school with. So, wow, this is great, man. So, I did the day's work, and at the end of the day, he asked me, he said, uh, where'd you park? I said, I, I don't, uh, I, I, my truck's broke down. I'm just going to hitchhike home or something. I'll get there somehow. He goes, well, where do you live? I said, Brisbane. He goes, I live in San Bruno. It's just the next town down. I'll give you a ride. In fact, I'll give you a ride to and from work to get the money to fix your truck. Hey, that's cool. Right on, man. Thanks. Get in his car and we're driving home and he's got this guy telling me about Jesus on the radio. And I said, hey man, what, you know, you, can I change the station? And, no, no, I, I like this, this is good. I didn't understand it, I, I just, so he said, all right, I'll put on some music. You put on some music and there's some lady singing about Jesus, you know, and it's like, I goes, dude, you got a Lacey DC, you know, or Leonard Skinner, somebody, come on. No, no, no. For the next three months, I was encapsulated in this car with this guy. And at lunchtime, he'd pull out his Bible and he'd start reading. And he said, I go, what do you got there? It was my Bible. I said, yeah, why are you reading that? He goes, well, I'm a Christian now. I go, what are you talking about? I'm, we went to Catholic school. We're Christians. He goes, no, no, no. I'm born again. I'm a child of the Most High God. I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. And I said, oh, you're one of those Christians. And uh, he said, yeah, man. And he was started to witness to me about the love of Jesus Christ. And it got to the point where I couldn't stand it anymore. Man, I, if, I, if there was a prayer I prayed, it was, Lord, give me enough money to fix my truck. You know, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. And what I used to do was, at, at lunchtime, it got so bad that I would leave at lunchtime because he'd bring out his Bible and tell me stuff. And I'd go to the bar and, and I'd eat my lunch a little, you know, grill, bar and grill and, and, uh, he wouldn't really bother me too much there, but after work, he, he'd go to take me home. I'd say, no, leave me off here. I, I pretty much lived in a bar in the town I lived in, and he'd leave me off, and it was like, Phew, reprieve, reprieve, you know? Well, after a couple of months, one day he walked into the bar after me, and I said, man, what are you doing in here? Well, don't you know who's in here? There's a bunch of sinners and adulterers and murderers and thieves and nasty people in here. You don't want to be in here, man. He goes, no, it's okay. I I just want to talk to you about the Lord. And I go, look, I'm done with you, Bob. His name was Bob. I'm done with you, Bob. I go, if you knew half the things, just half the things that I had done, you wouldn't even want to be talking to me, man. You'd be afraid of me. He says, all right, let me ask you three questions. After you answer these three questions, if, if you want me to go away, I'll go away. So, all right, three questions. He said, if you were to die right now and sit before God in his heaven, and he said, why should I let you in? What would you say? I said, that, that's easy. Pull the trap door, man, and let me go because I don't belong up here. I belong, you know, in, in the other place. He said, okay, fair enough. I said, Bob, you don't get it because I'm telling you, if you knew just half the things I've done, he goes, no, no, no it's all right, it's all right. See the guy down at the end of the bar there? <laughs> yeah. He owes the bartender $10. You, on the other hand, owe the bartender $10,000. Bartender goes to the guy at the end of the bar and says, hey, 
You know that 10 bucks you owe me? The guy says, I ain't got it, man. Don't worry about it. It's taken care of. It's paid for. No problem. You don't owe me anything. We're square. And then he comes up to you and he says, hey, you know that $10,000 you owe me? And you say, I ain't got it. I said, why ain't that the truth? And he said, you know what? It's forgiven. It's taken care of. You don't owe me a dime. It's been paid for. Which one of you two would be more indebted to that man? I said, Bob, I ain't the most sharpest pencil in the box, but I know that. He just forgave me $10,000. I go, I'd be. I'd be more indebted to him. He said, all right. That's what Jesus did for you on the cross. It doesn't matter whether you have 10 sins, 10,000 sins, or 10 million sins. He paid for them all on the cross. It's a free gift, Matthew. All you have to do is accept it. So, accept it. I'm just free. It doesn't cost me anything. No, it's free, man. So, all right, let me ask you the last question. You know, the Bible says that these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. Not that you wish, not that you hope, not that you might have eternal life, but that you may know you have eternal life. You can be guaranteed to go to heaven. I said, wait a minute, time out. You and I are both raised Catholic. You know how that works, man. You, you try your best, and then when you get to heaven, your bad outweighs your good, and you get let in. There ain't no guarantee. He goes, the Bible says it's guaranteed, man. I said, okay. So I can be completely forgiven of everything I've ever done. He goes, not only up till this point, but whatever you do tomorrow or the next day, forever, all your sins. It's a free gift. I said, I want that. And guaranteed to go to heaven? Yeah, I, I want that. Give me that. He looked around in the bar and he goes, eh, not in here. Come on, let's go outside. So we got in his car and we drove up to the apartment that I was living in with my beautiful wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. And uh, in the parking lot, I said the sinner's prayer, repeated after him, and I accepted the Lord as my, my personal savior. And he looked at me, he said, do you feel any different? And I said, no. He said, you will. I lived on the top floor of this apartment building, and by the time I climbed those three flights of stairs and walked into my apartment building, the Holy Spirit hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, I started tearing Hell's Angel posters down off the wall, and I had these nasty little knick-knack, bric-a-brac things. I grabbed a garbage can, I was filling up this garbage can, and my wife said, my, my wife, my girlfriend at the time said, she said, what are you doing? What are you on now? What have you been smoking? I said, no, no, no. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and this stuff's got to go, and I can't have this in my life anymore. And I stopped and looked at her, and I said, and I would have never thought this in a million years because it never dawned on me before. I never thought it was wrong, but we can't live together anymore. We have to either get married or you have to move out. I started going to a little church in town and talked to the pastor there. This was January 12th, 1985. I started talking to him and he said, bring Gina down and we'll go through some counseling and we'll get you guys married. He never told me that he had a problem with us being unequally yoked. And so Gina came down and, and we went through this counseling and, and he explained the gospel to her clearer than I've ever heard it explained in my whole life. And she got out of the chair she was shit sitting in and said, I don't want any of your Jesus junk. Don't try and shove it down my throat. I'm just here to get married. Leave me alone. I went, whoa, you go girl. That's my biker mama, man. She's bad. Anyway, he got the whole church to pray for us and I didn't even know that. My birthday is February 9th. On my birthday, she got me a cake and a present and I don't even remember what the present was, but on a card, I opened up the card and we had been saying to each other for the last four years, I will love you forever and a day. And I read that card and it said, I will love you. Happy birthday. I will love you forever and a day. And I looked up at her and I said, I will love you forever and a day too, but it's not going to be the same place. You're not going where I'm going. And she started to cry, and I started to cry. And she says, I want what you have. I've seen such a difference in your life. I want what you have. How do I get that? And the guy who led me to the Lord left me this little chick track, and, and we read it together, and she accepted the Lord. And my daughter was living with us at the time. She was 10 years old. And actually, we got married February 16th, and we were both saved. So uh, he didn't have to unequally yoke us.
Um, and then that summer we sent our daughter to Bible vacation school and she came home saved. And God is good. He is so good. Um, I just want to let you guys know, you can never, never be bad enough to be kept out of God's kingdom, out of his love, out of his, his pleasure. And you can never be good enough to get let in either. You can't get there on your own works. It's only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He rose from the dead in victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the grave, victory over Satan, victory over every aspect of our lives. And he holds it out to you as a free gift. It's yours. It's yours. All you gotta do is take it. Just take it. It's yours. It's that simple. If there's anybody out there who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, just lift up your hand. There are people here who will pray with you and lead you to a saving faith and knowledge in Jesus Christ. You would be welcomed into the family as a new son or daughter. It says that the angels rejoice, actually have a celebration in heaven for you. Why don't you guys all repeat this after me, just in case there's someone there who's a little shy. Heavenly Father, Thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. Thank you that you've forgiven me of all my sins, past, present, and future. Thank you that you have made a way for me to enter into your kingdom. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and take over my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Any of you that have said that prayer, you're now a new creation. You're now, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The angels are having a celebration in heaven over you right now. You know, most people, it was like me. I was too busy partying to come to a celebration. Come to a celebration. It's wonderful. God bless you. Thank you for your time.